Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome uh, to our mental wellness, um, mental health awareness uh, forum hosted by Proudly South African. Uh, thank you, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. My name is Happy. Maku Malongidi. I am the Chief Marketing Officer at Proudly South African, but I'm also your uh, Program Director on this gloomy morning. Uh, we're hoping that you're all keeping safe uh, wherever you may be logging on from. Uh, it, it's keeping safe on many levels. Um, you know, uh, weather, and, uh, but most importantly, keeping safe uh, by uh, fighting the war, the war that we as a people uh, are collectively fighting, uh, a war that nothing could have prepared us for, and that is the uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, with that said, welcome to everybody. Welcome to especially our speakers this morning. Uh, thank you, thank you for I, I, I'm hitting our call uh, and responding so positively to our invitation at Proudly South African for you to join us and share your expertise uh, on this very, very important discussion and topic uh, this morning. And thank you to all the attendees that are currently online. We appreciate the fact that you've made time to come in here, what we have to share with you today. Uh, thank you, thank you for uh, to everybody who has managed to put uh, this session together. Uh, so, with uh, that said, uh, we we have a very a bumper uh, a program, but very interesting, and uh, we have a speaker from um, from Workforce Healthcare. Uh, Neva, Vanya Naidu on, on the line, uh, who is the Executive Director for Wellness. We also have Masha Gabriel uh, from Camp Group South Africa. Um, uh, Masha is uh, Chief Business Development Officer and Camp Group South Africa, by the way, is a uh, member company. Uh, they've just recently joined the movement. Welcome, uh, Masha. Uh, and uh, we also have Cassie Chambers, who is Operations Director uh, at uh, SEDEC. Uh, thank you, thank you, Casey, for joining us as well today. Um, and uh, we, um, so to kick off with the formalities of the, of the discussion this morning, I think it's safe to say that a business as we know it today um, will honestly will never be the same again in terms of um, us as, as a workforce trying to fit into what we now know as the norm. Whether we'll ever be able to go back to uh, what the norm uh, means to us uh, still remains to be seen. A lot of us miss it. I mean, we miss coming to the office on a daily basis uh, as a full workforce. We love uh, interacting with each other. We miss rather interacting with each other. We miss hugging each other. We miss um, being silly and we miss, uh, you know, high fives in the office when things go right. We miss, uh, you know, letting our guard down, really, and being normal and being human, and 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 uh, you know, and, and 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 being being ourselves. We miss that, um, you know. Um, so much has happened. So so much has happened in the last eleven months, where we, the world over, you know, the country, all businesses, most business, all businesses have not been the same um, uh, from around last year, this time maybe from around uh, March of last year. So how do businesses cope? Uh, how do businesses cope? What measures have businesses put in place? Uh, what, 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 you know, how have uh, the, how has the workforce uh, 
you know, uh, uh, how have they adjusted to the new norm? Uh, are people struggling? Are people coping? Uh, are we just doing our best and giving it our best shot? Uh, you know, and, and if we want to put all of this aside for one second, uh, what is critical to remember is that in the midst of all this craziness uh, where we find ourselves in, in the, in the, work, in the workspace, um, you know, there is still a business to be run. I, th I think for me, that is what keeps me going. The fact that there is still a business that has a responsibility to be run properly. Um, and, and so I will take you through, you know, under normal circumstances, when we do, when we, when, when proudly South African hosts these business forums, is that we have uh, our CEO who will take the audience through the work that we do, uh, you know, the strides that we've made, uh, take, talk about membership opportunities and all of that. But today he is not going to join us uh, uh, because we have a topic of a different kind. Therefore, as your MC, I will also step in and speak to you about the kind of stuff that proudly South African has also put in place to ensure that we adjust to the new norm. Uh, we also have business. Uh, we are also affected by all of it. Um, and, and, and we are fortunate enough because we haven't had COVID-19 has not um, forced us to close our doors to shut our doors as a business. Uh, and, and we are grateful, we are thankful, uh, we are mindful to that, and we really, really uh, are grateful that, that we have not been affected that much. But what health measures uh, have we put in place to try and how have we dealt with it, honestly, too? We've done all we can, um, just like any business. Uh, you know, we've put uh, measures in place. We've got sanitizers everywhere. We, uh, you know, we we have got. We've had to, uh, you know, repurpose the business, if you like. We've had to cut down on the number of days and hours that people physically come into the office. There's a schedule that we follow. You know, some departments come twice a week to the office. Some come three times a week to the office. All of this is done in the spirit of trying to manage the, 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 the pandemic, managing the health issues and, and trying to give, give our workforce some sort of normality, uh, so to speak. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of information that comes from the HR department on a daily, you know, as, as, as often as possible that takes you through the, the, the COVID, the pandemic protocols, what to do, what not to do. Uh, we share information we get from medical, uh, medical aids, um, you know, about health issues, about how to cope, about all sorts of things. But even with that said, you know, ultimately, uh, the the responsibility still lies with, with us as individuals. Just like the president said, it is all in our hands. Uh, none of us could have an expectation uh, from anybody. Even the business that where we as individuals expect as, you know, something from, the business and uh, the workplace is not just a building. The workplace is run by human beings. Those human beings, be they, you know, the board of the company, be it the executives of the company, be it the managers of the company, those people are still people as well. They still, they do have the same concerns like any other person that works for the business. They say they still have the same worries. They still have the same health concerns. They still have, so, so a business is not just a building. It is, it really takes individuals to run that business. So it's about striking a balance, Start striking a balance in terms of expectations, uh, you know, from individuals, from the workforce, from everybody. And um, so, so with that said, before we go to our next year, and it was important for me to also give just some sort of a, uh, you know, insight into what the, our business, as the host of the forum, our business has had to do. Uh, in the in in the in the in the uh, interest or, or of trying to find the right balance, um, 
we do know that, uh, you know, the pandemic has had more than just an economic cost to the country. This psychosocial, uh, a psychosocial uh, impact on families, the work teams and other communities is however harder to assess as mental health is a topic that many people avoid denying it as a perceived weakness in themselves and others. So um, business leaders are of course often parents uh, themselves and which is exactly what I've just alluded to earlier on that business leaders are also uh, parents themselves and human beings themselves and have faced the demands of working from home, managing children, uh, homeschooling and continuing to provide guidance and security to work because when jobs have been in jeopardy and retrenchment notices have had to be served. Even if the workplace has remained intact, leadership has had to be demonstrated at arm's length. And this too has not been easy. When you do not have face-to-face -face contact with your team and, and are unable to read the room or gauge a mood, it is hard to assess the underlying sentiments of a team. In the absence of real contact, empathy has been the most valuable currency in dealing with the virtual workplace on a screen only, uh, you know, a with a virtual workplace and on screen only employees. The most successful leaders are those who have had regular informal interactions with their team, inviting sharing of lockdown experiences, occasionally, occasionally leaving work aside in favor of simply meeting uh, of people who are all weathering the same storm and are not professional colleagues. We cannot say that we cannot say is uh, what we cannot say is that we are all in the same boat. We may have all experienced the same turbulencies, but we are not all in the same boat. Some people have been alone and isolated from close friends and family. Others have felt crowded, surrounded as they have been 24-7 uh, by family members taking through our own personal version of lockdown with a sympathetic and empathetic captain leader who has had their hand on the tiller, guiding the ship and its crew through the stormy seas of COVID-19 and lockdown anxieties is the one whose team will return to work, uh, stabilized and knowing just what, it, it, what is expected and equally what is not expected of them in this changed work environment. So with that said, and having shared that with you, it gives me great pleasure to now um, welcome onto the um, platform. Uh, I was tempted to say onto stage, uh, but onto the platform, our first speaker who will, um, you know, give us insights uh, of, 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 you know, what this truly means, um, the time that we find ourselves in. And uh, Nevania Naidu, if you could please uh, switch on your camera. Uh, Nevania is uh, an executive director for wellness at Workforce Healthcare. We can't wait to hear from you, Nevania. Welcome to this uh, so important discussion around mental health issues in the workplace. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Happy, um, and a big thank you to Proudly South African um, for hosting a session on such an important topic. Um, it's something that is of critical importance, especially right now. Um, and I think although a lot of people talk about mental health and the effects that it's had, we don't really understand it. And I like what you said, Happy, you know, although we all are facing the same scenarios, we all are in different circumstances. And so the way that we deal with it means that um, the way we react to it is very different depending on our circumstances. Um, what I would like to do today is to tell you about, um, you know, what it is that we are finding. So as mentioned, my name is Navanya Naidu. I am the Director of Wellness at Workforce Healthcare. Um, Workforce Healthcare is an employee assistance program or a health and well-being program service provider. And what we have found is that um, we currently run a call center with uh, registered counselors, psychologists, social workers. So we can really say that we've been in the crux of it all. And we've really seen as the different waves of the COVID-19 um, virus have gone up and down, so too have the calls coming into our call center from a mental health perspective. So today what I'd like to do is to share some of that insight with you in terms of what it is that we have found with the employees that call into our call center. 
So what we have found is that when you talk about the words COVID-19 or the coronavirus or the pandemic, it often leads to a number of different thoughts and fears coming up in your mind. Um, a lot of the time it has led to financial stress for a lot of people. Um, and this is really linked to the fact that we have gone through an economic crisis because of the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of people during the first lockdown, the level five lockdowns, were either not allowed to be going to work because they were not in uh, what was termed a, an essential service, which meant that their budgets were cut or their, their salaries were cut or they received the TERS benefit. But we know that that was only a percentage of people's salaries and it didn't really allow them to fulfill all of their obligations. Further to that, we had a number of businesses that were closed down or closing down and still are. And that led to retrenchments. So a lot of people underwent a lot of financial stress. I think a lot of parents also had to pay school fees, but also had to be at home to take care of their kids because schools were closed. And for a lot of people, it, it meant that they either couldn't be at home because they were still at work and they had to hire nannies or au pairs to also assist, which meant an additional financial burden to them. Other terms that you think of when it comes to COVID-19 include loss, loneliness, um, suicide, people potentially looking at suicide. Why is this? What we have found is that COVID-19 has led to a lot of people being isolated isolated from our support centers, isolated from our family members. For those people who live by themselves, for example, lockdown level five, was an in, level five was an intense time for them because it meant they couldn't go out, they couldn't see people, they couldn't go to work. So all of their normal daily social interactions were cut down or minimized. Now, for someone who is depressed, this can be extremely debilitating. And that meant that people were contemplating suicide. They didn't have people to reach out to. You know, it exacerbated the feelings of loneliness for them. Furthermore, you had a lot of stress. Stress about what is happening in this world. I, for example, as a parent, was extremely stressed about my children. Um, do I have to send them back to school? What would it mean if I, as a parent, am working from home because it's not safe? How can I be expected to send my children to school? What kind of a mother would that make me? Further to that, does my boss understand that I have comorbidities, for example, um, that I cannot come back to work right now? Will that jeopardize my job? What does that mean for me? And that also led to a lot of fear a lot of paranoia even. So people were constantly concerned, um, still are, about getting the virus itself. So do I go out to the shops to buy a loaf of bread? Um, do I go out and see people? You know, we are always saying that you need to stay home, but at what point does it become paranoid? Um, you know, I know that uh, I personally experienced where I was told I'm doing an injustice to my children because I'm teaching them to wear masks and not touch people. And I thought to myself, but where's the balance? You know, for me, the fact that children know that they have to keep their, their masks on um, or that they have to ensure that they do not hold friends' hands or hold the teacher's hand, etc., for me was a positive thing. Um, you know, but at what stage do we become to instill or we are, are we starting to instill paranoia and intense fear into our family members about what is or, or what can and cannot be done? Um, you know, and this led to a lot of anxiety. Um, you know, are we really causing harm to our family members by not allowing them to, to go out, for example, especially young children who are really social creatures? You know, they want to play, they want to have play dates. Also, what we're finding, especially now with the amount of death and loss and bereavement that we are facing, is it's also leading, leading to a lot of complicated grief. So number one, your family member goes into hospital. So normally, if a family member is in hospital, we all take the time to visit them. You know, there's three visiting hours um, in the day at a hospital, and we make sure we clear our schedules to be able to visit them so that they do not feel alone. They feel that they're still supported and they want to get better and come out of hospital. Now, however, because of COVID restrictions, we cannot visit our loved ones. More specifically, if they are infected with COVID-19, they cannot be seen by any family member. The people that they are seen by are their doctors and their nurses, who are normally decked out in their full PPE, which means they're covered from head to toe. It's difficult to even make eye contact with them. 
And this can be quite difficult for people who feel that they might be on the verge of dying or not make it through the, next, the, the night, for example. And also for the people who are at home, you know, we would have to rely on being able to speak to doctors and nurses because often an employee, a, a, a family member is on a ventilator towards the last stages of life, which means that we also cannot say goodbye to them. And this leads to a number of situations where there's guilt. I've left my family member in hospital. I'm not there for them. But as you would feel in a trauma situation, there's a lot of what ifs that pass through your mind. You know, what if I could be there for them? What would I say to them? How can I assist them? You know, what if I didn't go out to the shop? Maybe I infected my family members. So all of these things go through your mind. Also, South Africa is a very culturally rich country. So we have many different cultures in our country. And with that, it means that we also have many different rituals that we perform when someone passes away in a family. So we believe that there are various last rites rituals that we have to perform. But now with COVID, it's robbing us of those last rites and rituals. It means, first of all, we don't get to say goodbye to our family members when they pass away in hospital. We don't even get to see their, their faces you know, for one last time. For example, in the Indian culture, we have an open casket, you know, to say our last goodbyes, but we can't do that with COVID anymore because the body is wrapped up and even the casket is wrapped up in this, in this um, you know, in order to protect people. Furthermore, we can't perform the last rites. So there's a feeling of guilt. Is my family member going to rest in peace um, because I haven't performed all of those last rites and rituals? And all of this is something that leaves lasting remnants in our, you know, in our lives. It, it, it affects us on a mental basis. That's, it's something that will take a long time to get over. And that is why it's not just grief, but complicated grief. And then lastly, there seems to still be a stigma attached to COVID-19. And this is one that I grapple with personally, because it's not, you know, there are people who are getting it no matter how safe and secure they are. They wear their masks. They don't go out. They only go out for essential things, yet they still get COVID-19. Yet when somebody gets COVID-19, people are told, no, don't tell anybody else. We don't want them to know that the person died of COVID-19. Why is that? COVID-19 is everywhere at the moment. There shouldn't be a stigma and we need to work to get rid of the stigma as well. So what is it that the workplaces have been faced with? And what is it that we as employees have been faced with? So the first thing is last year in March, 2020, we were told that we would be going into level five lockdown. And that meant that we had to move into remote working. I had literally two days to set up an entire call center to work remotely. At that stage, I thought it couldn't be done. It was something that I had looked towards in the future that I needed to make it possible. However, at that time, I had to make it happen in two days. And to tell you the truth, we are now sitting almost 12 months later and my call center is still working remotely. And I haven't had a single complaint from a client or from the people working remotely. So what it meant was we had to change the way we work. We had to adapt to the fact that we wouldn't get in our cars in the morning and we wouldn't have to drive to work every single day. What that also meant is that there's a sense of detachment from the workplace. So there was a normalcy in the fact that for about eight hours of the day, you would spend the day with your colleagues. And what that meant is you would have a little bit of time to have a break during your day where you'd have corridor talk or you'd meet at the coffee machine or the water machine and you have a little bit of a break. You know, you'd catch up on what's happening, what's happening within the organization, what's happening in the news even. And you'd consider that a little bit of break of a break. Whereas now, I don't know about most people, but for myself specifically, and I can also talk for my husband who's working from home, we spend a lot of our time simply sitting in front of our laptops or our computers. There is no time for a break. Um, you know, I've even said to people that it feels like we're still at work because even though my husband and I are working in the same house at the moment, we don't see each other until the evening. It's like two ships that are passing in the night. Um, and that meant that there's a lot less interaction on a social level. So yes, we do have our meetings, but it's a lot less personal as well. You also find that people who are working remotely had to find spaces to work. So that led to another level of stress. Where am I going to set up my workspace? 
I also have to set up space for my children because they are also doing online schooling. I also had to make sure my husband had a quiet space. And if, for example, you've got four people in a household who are all on an online call or lesson at the same time, first of all, there's immense pressure on your internet, um, which means you've got people, you know, screaming at each other, who's on the internet, that type of thing. There's a lot of stress. As parents, you'll find that you're also distracted. It's difficult for your children to not come in and speak to their mums and dads during the course of the day. Whereas at work, you know that you'd make a call to your children, check how they're doing, and that was that. Whereas now, there is a sense of being distracted. You're checking in on your family every now and then. There's also a sense of not knowing. So I know my teens constantly ask me, when do you think we'll be heading back to the office? And to be honest, I don't have an answer. So there is a sense of not knowing, of uncertainty. And we know as human beings, when we have uncertainty, it leads to stress and anxiety because we don't know what's coming next. We know that COVID is still there. So people are afraid. They're afraid that if, for example, their workplace says you have to come back to work now, what does that mean? It means I could get or I could contract the virus. So that leads to a lot more fear and anxiety as well. As I mentioned, there's a lot less interaction with colleagues. And we know that as human beings, we are social beings, and especially for people who are seen as extroverts, they need to be able to interact with people. You know, I have a colleague who'd often, you know, spend a lot of time going around the office, checking in on everyone, making sure they were okay, and now having to sit at home um, and not be able to check in on that level means that the person is now detached from their colleagues. For myself, for example, I'm an introvert. And especially during the course of last year, I was fine. I was happy with working from home. You know, I was happy with the new norm. But even for me now, as we approach the anniversary of the first lockdown, you know, it's become a bit much. I miss my colleagues. Um, as Happy said, you miss the happy at the high fives, the ability to celebrate wins with your teams, um, you know. The ability to bounce something off of my colleague, you know, now if I want to check something, I've got to pick up the phone and it seems like a hassle sometimes, um, you know, as opposed to just walking over to their desk and having a quick chat, um, you know, being able to see my colleagues face to face, go for lunch, you know, to be able to have those chats about our families, etc. We no longer get to celebrate with them as well. And it means that we, we, we tend to feel isolated. Also, what you find is that when we do have a conversation, whether it be via email, um, via a, um, an online call, over the telephone, we all seem to be in adult mode. So I'm not sure if any of you would be familiar with the adult child um, and the parent mode, but at this stage, we're all in the adult mode all of the time. So when you do call a colleague, you get straight to business. You know, it's, hi, how are you? Um, I needed to quickly chat to you about this. Even on our calls, hi, how's everybody doing? You're safe? Good, family's good, right, let's get down to business. Because we feel like we're constantly on the back foot. So this means that people are starting to feel socially isolated. So besides the fact that they have less interaction with their colleagues, at this stage, they also have less interaction with their family members. So even though during the week, we don't have a lot of interaction with necessarily family or extended family, we normally at least have some kind of interaction um, with colleagues, which has now also been taken away from us. Digital fatigue. This is something I never thought I would say or see. You know, it was, it was a, a non-existent problem for many people. However, right now, this is something that most people are feeling. We're constantly in front of our computers. We're constantly in meetings. Whereas in the old, I, would, I call it the old days now because it feels like that. Whereas previously we would go to a meeting, after the meeting we'd get into our car and drive back to our offices. And that small commute gave us a chance to listen to the radio, for example, to sort of de-stress or to take in what it was in that meeting. And you had a little bit of free time. Whereas now what people are finding is because we're at home, or because of our meetings being online, people tend to book meetings back to back. So I often don't even have a 10 minute break in between my meetings um, to go grab a cup of coffee. You know, I'm one of the lucky ones. I have a nanny at home and she's kind of, you know, just pops into the door, brings coffee, brings lunch, etc. And if it wasn't for her, I'd be going throughout the day um, with just being in one meeting after the other. 
what we've also found is that our digital meetings, whether it be via Zoom, via Teams, Blue Jeans, um, you know, whatever the case may be, is it's a lot more intense. You're now staring at the faces of the people that you're meeting with. You're also having to look at them to understand what their possible nonverbal cues are. You're no longer sitting in front of them in a face-to-face -face basis where you can look at their nonverbal cues to see and understand what it is that they're feeling in the meeting. You're now having to try and ascertain and understand all of that through this. And it's important to try and understand, you know, you're also looking at your own face at the same time, um, you know, which is something you never saw before. And this can take up quite a bit of time as well when, when actually dealing with this Zoom fatigue or digital fatigue because you're constantly in these back-to-back -back meetings. There is no break in between. What I have also found is that you have longer working hours. So now, whereas, you know, in the, in the past, you would get into your vehicle and you would drive to work. And at the end of the workday, you would close your laptop, put it in your boot and drive back home. There is none of that anymore. Your day kind of just keeps rolling into the next day and you have less boundaries. Um, I personally find myself having meetings at seven, at eight, because we can. It's just a matter of popping into my study, connecting to the virtual call, and it's done. The hassle of driving to a meeting is no longer there. So you're finding that people are, are working a lot longer hours. I also find that people feel a sense of guilt if they are not in front of their computer. So there's almost this assumption because you're at home, people can slack off. So people find, tend to find find themselves feeling guilty if they're not in front of their, uh, their computer throughout the workday. So whereas people would often zip out to fetch their children from school um, or pop out to the shop to get some lunch, they're no longer doing that. Um, you know, they're simply in front of their computer for most of the day and most of the evening as well. Um, you even find on weekends, um, you know, the days are simply following into each other. What you also find is there's a lack of communication or too much communication. And this really depends on the type of manager or the type of employees that you have. So I'm sure you've all seen the meme which says this could have been an email. And I think people need to remember that, you know, not everything requires a meeting. Um, sometimes a quick email and saying, you know, if you need to chat, just give me a call is important. But also to understand the type of employees you have. So some employees need that face-to-face -face interaction. And so as a manager, it becomes quite exhausting and daunting to be able to ensure that you get a balance between the two. What's also important is to make sure that your staff have accessibility. So we all know that our beloved power utility has enforced load shedding. And that means that we are sometimes left without internet, without power, and that leads to further stress. Um, it's also important to make sure that employees feel they have access to the correct resources, printers, computers, laptops, 3G, etc. So in closing, I see I'm being shown my timer. I just want to highlight what are our employees facing right now? Fear. It can even lead to debilitating fear. There's a fear of contracting the virus, while simultaneously there's a fear of losing employment. So if my boss forces me to come into work, what am I going to do? Once again, there's, a, there's grief. And again, as I mentioned, it's complicated grief. No goodbyes, last rituals and, and rites, um, you know, the lack thereof. Also, the loss of, our, of, of the way things were is important to remember as well. There is, it's not a new normal anymore, it's just normal. The dual roles that people are facing, you're a parent, you're a teacher, you're an employee, and this leads to burnout. People are feeling overworked. There's too many roles that they have to play in this current pandemic. And there's also long hours. And all of this also leads to frustration, a lack of resources, like I said. In today's session, you know, I was concerned, will I be having load shedding? You know, it causes anxiety, the not knowing and the lack of clarity. So as an organization, what can you do? It's important for you to be able to provide the correct resources for your employees. Make sure they have access to support. Employee wellness be a pro programs such as ours, where you offer 24-hour counseling, legal services. A lot of people have decided to make sure that their wills are updated, you know, because we don't know what's going to happen. Periodic check-ins with employees and make sure that these check-ins are not just work-related. Have a session where it's just a coffee session where you're just checking in on your employees. 
to make it more social. Communication, remember, not too much and not too little communication. And also create an understanding of what people are going through right now and normalizing that situation for them to understand that we all appear, you know, most people are parents. So hearing your children in the background is nothing to be afraid of sometimes. And with that, I would like to say that as a country, we are going through a, diff, a very difficult time. And it's important to reach out to people during this time to make sure that they have support no matter who it is and you know that that although things are very difficult right now you know things will become better at some point again thank you to proudly south african um and uh if, if people do have questions you're more than welcome to contact me my details will be shared later thank you Thank you so much, Nevania. Thank you, thank you, thank you for such, uh, you know, for your invaluable input. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I feel like we can all relate to most of the things that you're saying, if not all of them. And um, it, it's so, you know, and this is such a, I appreciate this time because it gives us time to, to, to step back a little bit and hear somebody else, uh, you know, take you through what what you may have gone through, what you possibly are going through, uh, what you possibly are struggling with on a daily basis. And and my take out from, from some of the things that you've shared with us, uh, Nevenia, which are important, is that the guilt, you know, most of us have gone through the guilt repeatedly, particularly if you have a loved one who is in hospital and in light of the pandemic, you can't go and see them. You rely on complete strangers, which is the healthcare workers, bless their hearts, because under the normal circumstances, I can't even begin to imagine what they're dealing with in hospitals. But you, 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 you know, the, the, the life of your loved one is in the hands of complete strangers who are checking up on your loved one in the, you know, because the reality is you can't go check up, you know, on them. And that is norm, that is not normal. Uh, you know, in our, in our, in, in, you know, as, 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 as we know, uh, life, uh, you know, like we know it, that is not normal. Uh, the rituals that you were talking about, um, you know, uh, we've attended so uh, many funerals virtually, uh, where we see that the norm is not practiced. Uh, because, um, you know, uh, you, you're not allowed to do it. And many, 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 many uh, people uh, in light of their of their cultures, they are they are really really struggling with this new norm where they can't perform their rituals. And uh, we are all we may not be infected, so some of us you know cannot have an opinion about how people have been infected by the virus must uh, uh, you know behave or must uh, respond to the virus or whatever the case may be. You know, I I, I, I live by this principle. You cannot even begin to have an opinion if unless you've walked my journey every step of the way in my shoes, you cannot have, uh, uh, you can't even begin to have an opinion about uh, yeah, my business. Uh, so, 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 you know, we are all, uh, we may not be all infected, but we are all affected. All of us, every, the world, everybody is affected one way or another. Uh, and like you said, no one is immune. Uh, you don't have to be reckless to be exposed to the pandemic. And I think in the past, you, you hit the nail on the head, uh, Nevenia. In the past week or two, uh, I have struggled a lot with that, that you don't have to be reckless. You can be the most organized person in the world. You can have all the uh, PPE in the world. You can be, you can have all the, you know, uh, every, a proper planning place, whether at home, uh, particularly, but, but, but it doesn't mean that you will not be exposed to, to, to this. And I struggled with that um, two days ago when I attended, a few days ago when I attended, virtually attended a burial of a, of a, of a stakeholder. A stroke colleague, uh, and and that was a rude awakening that you do not have to be reckless, um, and, uh, and 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 all of this, all of this, all of this is very heavy mentally on all of us 
one way or another. Uh, please uh, hang ten. I hope that you're still able to be with us, Nevania, because what we're going to do, we're going to get comments and, and questions uh, later on, uh, you know, during the Q's and A's uh, session. Uh, and with that said, it gives me great pleasure to now welcome Masha Gabriel. Uh, Masha, please switch on your camera. Uh, there we go. Hello, Masha. Masha is uh, Chief Business Development Officer mm. Uh, from Pem Group uh, SA. Great to see you again. And we can't wait to hear from you as a, as a member company of Proudly South African how this horrific, horrific, invisible enemy has affected your, your, your operation. But, but, you know, you're still standing as a business. Welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Happy. And good morning to everybody, um, all the panelists, speakers, and those that are, have actually tuned in uh, online. Thank you for the opportunity. And based on our time constraint, I'm going to get right through, right into this. So yes, excellent. Uh, as a Ken Group in South Africa is a conglomerate of eight companies with a staff complement of 305. And, um, you know, throughout the pandemic, it, we've never closed one day because we're also part of essential services. So since March, right up until December, we've had not one uh, case of COVID and we've had no infections. However, in December, um, I think we've had about three, three or four infections and that was during the holidays when we did close. So yes, as a company, we've had all our protocols. We were unable to work uh, remotely because of our production uh, capacities and because of us being the essential services. But through uh, navigating our staff through the pandemic, we've had no cases because we've maintained the COVID-19 protocols. So as a, as a group of company with 305 staff, how do we navigate through the COVID-19 pandemic? How do we as a company um, that is you know, highly regulated uh, to, to manufacture and to, to produce uh, uh, or to meet the demand of, uh, of, of those um, you know, in the economy and public and private sectors, how do we advance new frontiers with our staff in mind? How do we strengthen organizational capacity on all levels with real skills, responsibilities and remuneration? How do we as a company strengthen organizational communications and announce good news with tangible evidence of mobilizing resources in the midst of the crisis? How do we make the intelligent transition from the COVID-19 pandemic to a seamless flow of business sustainability? How do we expand our influence and trade the markets like a pro without being corrupt? So it's very interesting to know that um, just before I get into it, this is Chem Group SA and we are a conglomerate of about nine different companies and all our staff are, 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 are widely spread across these companies that are based in Durban, Johannesburg, Mozambique and in Dubai. Yet a company of this magnitude, a company that, uh, um, you know, with this co staff complement, how did we manage to stay safe? How did we adhere to our COVID-19 protocols? How did we continue? How did we maintain business continuity? And how did we navigate through this crisis? Kendrick SA Economic Recovery Plan is investing in people investing in business and investing in community. So from implementing innovation across the group, developing and manufacturing market leading products, business process improvements, groundbreaking strategies and entering new markets, none of these are possible without human intervention. And this we call our staff. Humans were created with an undeniable skill ability Therefore, it is imperative that we respect and esteem that. It takes people to move innovations from discovery to commercialization. It takes people to deliver value, improve service delivery, and good governance, along with redemptive freedom. 
So as business leaders, we must nurture, invest, and expand our staff's skills ability. And with this trust that surrounds us in the midst of this pandemic, and as the COVID-19 crisis continues, and amidst our overcrowded hospitals, fiscal corruption, massive job loss, and business closure, when others are ruthlessly maximizing profit while minimizing humanity, we as a group do business responsibly. So inside of this entire pandemic, you can do two things. You can either curse the darkness or show up with a candle. At Kemru, we decided to rise and stake our rightful claim as an economic superpower in the midst of this pandemic and leave no one behind as we navigate the perfect storm. So where are we currently as a group of companies? So Kim Group, right now I showed you the aspect, the image of an iceberg. While nothing is visible or very little is visible, and under, inside of this iceberg, there is massive action taking place. And as a group of companies, we are currently recruiting, training and developing entrepreneurs, agents, and startups. We are currently working with the informal traders. We are opening factory shops. We are engaging across Africa to eradicate poverty. And we are engaging with the public and private sectors. And have we, have, have we had any difficulty and challenges through this process? Most definitely we have. In fact, our biggest problem has been with both the public and private sector and getting them to join forces and get the picture and how to how to continue creating, how to continue to create massive action inside of this pandemic and leave no one behind. So this is where we are currently as a group of companies. And so I just want to uh, touch on uh, um, the different aspects in terms of our um, people development, business development, and our community development. So as a company, firstly, what we have done is we have given every one of our staff a 500 rands credit in our, at our factory stores. And this enables our staff to earn an extra income apart from their current salaries and make sanitizers and disinfectant soaps accessible in their communities. So while our staff are employed and still earn a, a good salary, there they have been people at, in their households that have lost their jobs. So hence, Chem Group SA have come alongside our staff and empowered them and allowed them given them actually 500 rand credit at all our factory stores and taught them how to create how to earn an extra income we have started with 500 rand and that figure has extended up to thousands of rands so the second aspect of how we have empowered uh, uh, communities and businesses is one second why doesn't this go through the other aspect is actually starting uh, and empowering women and youth to start their own businesses with 100% shareholder value through our factory shop concept and our fogging business. So this is a turnkey operation and it, it's, fully, it's fully fitted with your air conditions, your solar panels, your point of sale. It basically, it's a turnkey operation with the full stock and what we have done is engage with various MECs from the Department of Economic Development, tell them based on people losing their jobs, come alongside us, join forces, and let's create magic in the midst of this pandemic. We call it the perfect storm because as a group of companies, we actually saw, uh, we actually saw uh, uh, an opportunity. We are a petrochemical industry. Our services, our services include tar blending, manufacturing, blow molding, packaging, everything to do with bulk distribution of chemicals, uh, um, uh, you know, um, manufacturing of uh, um, lubricants for the automotive industries and uh, a bulk distribution of fuel and diesel. How do we as a company diversify one of our production lines to meet the requirement inside of this crisis? Therefore, Kim Group has called, the, has called 
COVID-19 our perfect storm because we've identified a market and in less than 24 hours we have diversified one of our production line inside of our refineries to basically manufacture sanitizers. And this is how we have become essential services. And we were able to move about 64 truckloads across Sadek in 48 hours. Can this be done? Absolutely. If we join forces, the work gets lighter. And this is our message to corporate South Africa. Leave no one behind. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's join forces and create magic in the midst of this pandemic. So this is one of the aspects of how we've empowered people that have lost their jobs. Women and youth, even men, not to be gender prejudiced in any way. We've taken South, South Africa by storm with those that have lost their jobs, with startups, with, with SMMEs, and we've said, we have lower hanging fruits. And for those that have an investment, let us link you up as to how to start businesses. And with that, have, and have, a, 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 and, a, have a positive effect because from, from us empowering you, you employ others, and that begins to start a process that continues economic recovery inside of this pandemic. So this has been key and we're taking this model throughout Africa. The second opportunity was the blend tech. We've, we've identified, so all our factory shops are created and built according to needs analysis. We're now building factory shops in under, in this entire factory shop can be done within a six weeks period, worst case scenario but we have done it in four weeks. So based on the needs analysis, all our taxi ranks, what we have done is put a factory shop there to meet the requirement in the lubricant industry and supply them with all the oils in the automotive industry. So according to, based on the needs analysis, all our business models are, are built to meet the immediate needs. To, to, to employ people, to create employment, to meet the economic requirement within South Africa as we currently stand. And as a team, it makes perfect sense to join forces and arise, pursue and conquer in the direction of victory. The other, the other second part of the business is because we are manufacturers of our fogging liquids and sanitizers, we have empowered people to start their fogging business. And what has happened in the market, and it is an absolute, I call this illicit trade. And we look at while we have major job losses and major business closure, still we have illicit business in the market that has triumphed magnificently. And how they have done that is by taking sanitizers and, and, and taking different fogging liquids and basically, um, you know, um, using this or, or, or doing this from a black market perspective or a backdoor, uh, uh, you know, initiative where it is really not SAPRA approval, really not a, a certified to the point that when fogged, it can basically, uh, uh, it can basically actually reduce uh, um, the, the, the infection rate. So that is the second opportunity in terms of our investment in people, communities and business. This is a much larger, larger opportunity for women owned service stations. And because um, uh, of time constraint, I'm gonna run through this. We're currently looking at negotiating, we're building uh, a lubricant plants across Africa. And that is part of our economic recovery plan. Again, I'm rushing through this because of time constraints. This is basically what our factory shops look like. And it's a turnkey operation for graduates, youth and women, innovation and entrepreneurial development. If some of you need this presentation, just so that we can uh, meet the time constraints, I'm willing to send this to you so that you could look at it, look at this. What is very close to the heart of Ken Group is how do we address how do we address, one second. How do we address our overcrowded prisons? How do we address our overcrowded prisons and how do we prevent returning inmates? We create a model that works inside of this pandemic. It costs our country 
massive amounts of money to maintain this. Yet in South Africa, we have 236 prisons. We have more prisons than manufacturing companies. So we have created and built capacity to maintain or to grow our inmates and our prisons, but we have not created a model to minimize our overcrowded prisons. We've not created a model to prevent returning inmates. And this is our, this is our cry to corporate South Africa, to both the public, public and private sectors, create a model that works, build a manufacturing plant, state of the art training centers and laboratories at the prison to skill our inmates. And while they will not earn a, a, a stipend, we take the stipends off those inmates and, and invest it in their families and their children's education and in the day-to-day -day needs. So do we have a model that works? Absolutely. And this is the current state of what our prisons are like at the moment. When freedom was six weeks old, Nelson Mandela said, meet despair with hope and death with a reaffirmation of beauty. And in conclusion, what I want to say is that during the pandemic, I likened Chem Group South Africa to that of a baobab tree. The principle of the baobab tree is that its roots grow 15 meters deep and its branches extend 38 to 48 meters wide. Inside the, magna, the, the, the massive bark of, a, of, of the, the baobab tree, it holds its resources to feed itself in the day of drought. And I liken Chem Group essay to that of a baobab tree, with our roots deep inside South African soils and our, and our branches extending into global markets. We are creating magic, encouraging business startups, creating employment, and really changing lives with a positive effect. And as, a, as every attendee that's viewing my presentation, and at the sound of my voice, I urge you to join forces and together let's provoke a better future. And with that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, panelists and speakers, I am undoubtedly confident that as we merge with diversity of skills, we will cement a unity and maintain a strong showing in, in world rankings that is unmatched by any other. Kendrick SA will set the benchmark for accurate data and empirical evidence by enthused leaders who genuinely share power with those on the breadline. We look forward to a collaborative partnership towards a robust company, an honor for us and indeed the people of South Africa. Stay strong, remain resilient, let your companies shine with light we will trade the markets like a pro again. God bless you proudly, South Africa. God bless you, South Africa. We will rise again. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Masha. Thank you. The, the passion with which you presented your, uh, you know, your story uh, is, is, is undeniable. Uh, thank you so so much. But also the 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 the, the work that Camp Group SA has done is really highly commendable, uh, particularly around uh, around this time. Uh, it is quite clear, given what you've shared with us, that the tight protocol structure that you've put in place as a business has worked in your favor, and it is highly commendable that during this whole period, the only time that four, if I, if I heard you correctly, four of your staff uh, members uh, that got infected was only during the, the festive uh, season uh, break, not, not during you know, that whole entire time while, while you know, some of us were struggling with, with infections and all of that, which really proves that uh, you know, uh, you've done, it, you've done it, it, an incredibly a good job and and your company stands uh, in regards to leaving no one behind i think uh, that's what i want to take from what you've shared with us do not leave anybody behind 
uh, uh, is, is a powerful um, line. But with that said, it comes with the responsibility that, uh, you know, as much as a company, as a company, you wouldn't want to leave anybody behind during these unprecedented times. People also need to be willing to walk the journey with the company as well. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it is all in your hands. It is all in our hands that a company as yours would want to, would have that stance, not to leave anybody behind, but do people also want to walk the journey with you? Because none of us knew, none of us could have pre, pre empted uh, what, um, you know, this pandemic would throw, would throw our way as a company. And I like the last pre, uh, uh, pre, um, uh, example you made of the baobab tree which is, resembles strength, tenacity, and resilience in my, in my view. And, uh, you know, and it goes without saying that that's exactly what Camp Ruth SA stands for. Thank you so much as a member company uh, to have shared uh, your story with us and share insights in terms of how you've navigated, uh, you know, your way through this, 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 this horrible, horrible uh, pandemic that has changed our lives forever, one way or another. Please hang 10. Uh, I hope that you still have a bit of time to listen to the last speaker, and then we'll take Q's and A's before uh, we end our session. Thank you so much, Masha. Great to see you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, now we move on to, uh, just to, 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 to remind our, our attendees to, to keep your, your, uh, you know, your questions and or comments. In fact, you're more than welcome, by the way, you're more than welcome to just jot them down on the, on, you know, on the chat uh, uh, box if you can. Uh, if, if it's not possible, uh, you're more than welcome to just join us when we do the Q&As uh, a little later on. We'd love to hear from you. I have no doubt that everybody, uh, everybody, everybody has got something to say uh, about, about what we're talking about today. So, so without uh, further ado, it now gives me great pleasure to ask, uh, I see she's already on screen, Casey, uh, uh, Casey rather, Casey uh, Chambers uh, from SADC. Uh, operations director. I want to assume uh, that Casey, um, you know, your, your, your organization is busy at any given time, at any given time, pandemic or not, really, that's why you exist. However, I cannot even begin to imagine what the last 10 months has been for SEDEC. Welcome, Casey. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so, so much, Happy, and good morning to everyone, wherever you are joining us from around the country. Um, it's always a really great platform um, just to be joining with such esteemed panelists and with Pride South African, but to talk on a really important topic, which is actually, if you asked us, and perhaps I'm a bit biased, but mental health should be the topic of conversation to start off our 2021. So as Happy mentioned, my name is Cassie Chambers. I'm the Operations Director at the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. This morning, I really want to just focus on the importance of mental health in the workplace. This should be a conversation that we do for four hours. Um, I'm going to try to wrap it in uh, less than 20 minutes because I know that we're tight and I really want to hear your questions um, to the panelists this morning. But this is really just to start the conversation um, and, and to start us thinking how differently we're going to look at 2021. Um, so there's a lot of information, um, but at this point is just starting that process and hopefully also echoing a lot of the important points that the panelists have already raised this morning. Um, the great thing is that all of you, all 44 of you are already here, so you already know that mental health is important and you're doing something about it by attending the webinar. So half my job is already done and here I'm just going to give you the tools and the resources to take it to the next level. So thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Um, if anyone can't see it, please do let me know. Okay, so to really kick off 2021, um, you know, a lot of uh, previous panelists have spoken about some of the, the issues and, and we've seen this in the press and media and even we ourselves can relate because this affects us, our team members, our staff, our colleagues, our family, our friends and our inner circle. 
2021, wow, what a start. I think so many people were excited to say goodbye to 2020. We were hoping for a change. We had different plans. Um, and I kind of feel like 2021, the theme so far is you make plans and God laughs. And I think this is where we go, um, is trying to kind of deal with the change, dealing with the adjustment, learning from all the different things that happened in 2020 and saying, what can we do differently now in 2021? COVID, we've seen, we've heard this morning, we've seen over the last 10 months, um, over 300 days since our lockdown at the end of March. COVID-19 has absolutely impacted every aspect of our life, the way we work, the way our family works, how we interact with family and friends, how we even go to the shops, you know, what is this new normal? Um, and normal is so overrated, but what does our 2021 look like? So if COVID has impacted so many aspects of our life and so many South Africans, of course it impacts the way that we work um, and puts so much extra pressure on that we never anticipated. I think 2020, um, we, we focused so much on employees who were at risk or who were vulnerable uh, and kind of just making sure that they were taking care of themselves and, and getting help and I think my message to you is for 2021 is that all employees and staff are vulnerable, are at risk. And so it's important that we focus on all of our staff um, and all of our employees. And this, again, a lot of what we're going to be sharing this morning, you can actually be using for your other family and friends and your inner support circle as well. Um, so mental health, I don't have to reiterate, is incredibly important to create awareness, especially now when so many people need it. I think the interesting thing for 2021 um, and the difference that we've even seen at SADAG is that last year was a lot of anxiety, fear, what if, what how. You know, we were hearing stories about people affected by COVID. We would maybe hear a colleague or, or a family, you know, somewhere down the line. But now everything is so close to home. It's in our families. There's loss, there's grief. Everything has just got so close to home. So we can all relate to feeling anxious, stressed, overwhelmed. Um, and this is why if we're feeling like that, everyone that you're working with is feeling the same. So when we have a look at why don't we already promote mental health awareness, and Happy, you already mentioned this, is that mental health was important before COVID. You know, we had mental health issues and stigma and discrimination before COVID happened. And then we kind of threw in all these extra triggers of COVID as, as mentioned earlier about unemployment, financial, family, online schooling. Um, it is only at 11 o'clock, so online schooling is going great. Um, it's, it's, I'm sure it's happy hour somewhere in the world for, for some poor mom. But I think when we have to look at why haven't we made mental health a priority in our workplace through creating awareness? And we know, as mentioned earlier, again, stigma, uh, the stigma of talking out, sharing, disclosing, Mental illness is taboo. Um, we work with various clients and companies, small, big, large, um, international, where they're still afraid to talk about mental health issues because if we talk about it, we're going to encourage people to come forward with mental health issues. And that's not the case. Um, there's also the view that mental health awareness or mental health treatment is expensive. It's expensive to do mental health awareness. Also, companies are too scared to discriminate. If we say the wrong thing, if we don't say the right thing, what's going to happen? So we'd rather do nothing and then we're safer. There's also the fear of talking about it within departments, teams, staff, managers. The reason being is that if we talk about it, uh, are we going to be treated differently? Are people going to think that we're crazy, that we're less than, then we're weak? We ourselves have our own self-stigma where the, what, how we talk and what we believe mental health to be is how we then perceive it around us. And I think this is where we need to really start at looking differently how we promote mental health um, awareness or mental well-being. When we look at some of the recent stats, and again, you know, you can you can look at some of the updates that are happening out there at the moment. Um, the WHO has actually said that the mental cost, the global economy, is over 2.5 trillion, not billion, 2.5 trillion dollars annually. And that's by not treating mental health. We know in South Africa, there's a treatment gap of one in 10 South Africans. So only one in 10 South Africans have access to mental health treatment. 
when we look at the cost of mental health expenses, we know that they are twice the rate of medical expenses. So medical expenses or mental health expenses means people that have to be hospitalized, have to see psychologists, take chronic medication. So if we can do more mental health awareness and be more proactive, we can actually reduce those costs. But what does this look like in South Africa? You know, we often talk about what's happening overseas and stats, and we don't have enough in South Africa. But the stats that we do have, and again, I'm happy to share these resources after this discussion, is in South Africa research that came out last July. So it's pretty recent. It's in the middle of COVID. Um, was that 46% of employees, that's nearly half, have pre-TSD symptoms. So imagine post-traumatic stress disorder, but we're still in the pandemic. So we have pre-TSD symptoms. Nearly half of employees had these symptoms already. And that was last July. Could you imagine what some of that, those percentage or stats would look like now? 35% of employees have high stress-related physical ill health. So that's going to a doctor, going about backache, digestive problems, headaches. It's having a physical issue with our bodies because of stress. We also know that one in three South Africans have a mental health issue. And therefore, these are people that we're working with across the desk or in our new remote, across the Zoom platform. These are people that are part of our new WhatsApp groups, our email chains. These are real people that we know and work with every day. So if we had to promote mental health wellness in the workplace or mental well-being, it will decrease absenteeism, it will increase productivity and increase our bottom line and, and get more profits. It will increase presenteeism. So these are all buzzwords that we're very used to seeing and hearing in the mental health wellness and, and employee space. It will also decrease psychological distress. And this is where we need acute intervention. We need people to, to go and seek professional care and be hospitalized or have acute situations mentioned earlier, like rehabilitation, hospitalization, or even suicide. It's less cost to business by creating mental health awareness. You're paying less for mental health treatment. And also you'll have less staff turnover. So to me, this all sounds like a win-win situation. However, how have we not yet got this right? And how do we not have enough companies that are doing more about it? And I think this is where the change starts with us, is that all of these different things, which are the buzzwords, this is what our managers and CEOs and financial directors all can respond to, you know, more people at work, being more productive, making more money, companies being more successful, it's a no-brainer. There's evidence and research to substantiate and to support all of these big allegations. Um, and I think it's those kinds of things that from that kind of level, whoever you are, whichever portfolio you, you manage at your company is sharing those resources with our managers, financial departments, even our HR, so that they can also be looking at putting in proper programs and policies. I think what's also really great is that we have a lot of South African data and research based on these exact things. And to tie with the theme of hashtag Pride South African, it's great to have Pride South African research and stuff especially for the South African market. So what we know from lockdown, I think the biggest theme as well is that it's okay not to be okay. Not all mental health issues is like the movies that we see with people who, who are in straight jackets or are dangerous or violent, but it's the people that we work with every day who, who often feel stressed or overwhelmed. And in our new normal, and maybe our new normal is a good thing because as mentioned earlier, they're happy you know, in, in, in the introduction is that the way we work has changed forever. We will never go back to how we used to work. But maybe that's a good thing. And maybe we can use this opportunity to make those changes that are so important. So it changes how we work, where we work, with who we work. Um, we know that with COVID and lockdown, it has increased anxiety, has increased stress, has increased burnout, trauma, grief, loss. Everyone is affected. And I heard that great quote, um, you know, we're all in the, the same storm, but we're in different boats. And I think it's that humanness of, of that, of, of the shared um, experience that, that we all have. So to start off, it starts with how we talk about mental health. There's examples of positive and negative language. And for service of time, I will be sharing this presentation so you can see these slides. And this would be great, something that you can screenshot now and you, say, you share on your company WhatsApp with your friend circle. This is way we learn, as if we can change how we talk about mental health, 
we can change how mental health is perceived in our workplace. So we don't call a person um, a schizophrenic or a depressive. We say a person who has depression, a person who has anxiety, because they are more than just their diagnosis. Um, you don't say there's an asthmatic. No, there's someone with asthma. Um, there's a cancer. No, there's someone who has cancer. So these are the kinds of things that we can do to slowly break the stigma around mental health. Someone who has a diagnosis of is not necessarily a sufferer of depression or a sufferer or a victim of anxiety. Mental health conditions, um, we don't call them mental health problems um, or disorders. We like to say mental health issues or conditions. And these are just some of the things that we're hoping if we can start changing in ourselves, we can see the change around us. Um, I think one of the, the, the common things that we're so used to talking about, and especially in the workplace, we don't often hear people talking about depression, bipolar, PTSD, uh, suicide, definitely not. But we do have more people using more acceptable terms, which kind of could mean similar things. So everyone can relate to feeling stressed. It's kind of the new buzzword. Everyone can say, oh, how are you doing? I'm feeling so stressed. Um, overwhelmed is a new one. Um, and I think I'm, I'm guilty of using this one myself, is but it's, I, I'm hectic. Hectic. Um, and it's just finding new ways that people are expressing themselves. I think the most important thing here, and, and I don't know from all the participants what portfolios or, or which departments you look after, and I'm really hoping that there's a whole diverse range, is we're having to lead by example and preparing our mental health in order to look after other people's mental health, whether it be your family, whether it be your team, whether it be your department, or maybe you're coming up with a policy for your whole company. It's practicing what we're preaching, it's leading by example. So the responsibility of mental health in the workplace is not just on HR, it's not just on the EAP or the manager, but it's actually everyone's role to be the mental health champion, to lead by example, and, and Happy mentioned this as well earlier, is that we can all be mental health champions wherever we are. It's all of our responsibility. So it starts with us. And this means um, back in the day when we could easily just get on an airplane and, and shoot around the country or the world, now it's, it's a, a big intention and there's a lot to thought that goes into getting on an airplane. But the most important thing that hasn't changed is that you're still asked to put on your own mask first. And this is something that we should be adapting. Again, screenshot this, share it on your WhatsApp group, share it on your screen of your computer, is constantly having the intention to make sure how are you today looking after yourself? How are you today looking after your mental health? If you can look after your mental health, it's easier to look after your mental health of people around you. You can't perform, function, grow, survive, if you're not looking after yourself first. And you also can't look after others if you're not looking after yourself. Um, here's some a really great, you know, especially with regards to working um, and looking after your mental health, some life hacks. And if you've ever Googled, there are so many great life hacks that you can look at from great things in the kitchen to how to keep your fruits and vegetables uh, fresher for longer. But here are some great life hacks that you can even follow. And this is also, again, proudly South African, follow the good things guy not only is there daily inspirational hopeful great nice stories that can lift your mood but there's also really practical tips i'll be sharing this so you can have a look and i challenge you to test out some of these hacks um, and see if they work for you or your team so what can we do this whole idea of positive psychology you know small steps big changes sharing articles inspiration quotes support coping tools Checking in and not checking in. You know, I've heard of a lot of companies who have morning check-ins online. Um, I think it's it's probably to check that everyone's awake um, and at their desk and at their computer. But using that check-in time for something different, doing a stretching ex exercise. And again, YouTube is great. There's two-minute stretching exercise that you can do at your desk without getting up. You don't have to wear a yoga outfit you don't have to go outside and have all these gym equipments. It's just stretching. It's good for our bodies and our minds. I know that whole saying, a healthy mind is a healthy body. Use those check-ins for something more positive, teaching coping skills, having a connected conversation. And I feel like this should be a whole webinar in itself 
And maybe it's part of SADAC's challenge to have something like, how do we talk to our colleagues about mental health? You know, so, so often we say, hello, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Thanks. And it's automatic. But have you really asked, no, how are you really doing today? How are you really coping today? Just that simple sentence can open up a different conversation where you can connect. It lifts both your mood and the other person's spirits as well. Plus, you have further insight. And in this whole world of physical distancing and everything happening remotely online faster, quicker than ever before, human connection, that social connection, is so important. Uh, being prepared and proactive, and that's all what mental health awareness is about, is trying to help lead people to the help. Um, so not waiting till there is a disaster or there's an urgency. And in all of our line of work, when we do talks for companies or we run after hours helplines or, or we're doing webinars, I cannot tell you how many employees do not know about the employee assistance program. I don't know what it is, they've never heard of it, or they know that maybe there is something, but they've never had to use it. So that could be your first step today, is to find out what EAP program is in place in your company. If you do have one, when last did you share that information with your team? Asking them to save it on their phone in case they ever need it. Have you ever found out what the benefits are and how people can access it? I mean, those are the simple things that you already have available, but by sharing it, someone in your team might really need it. Um, so finding out what resources are available, whether it be through your EAP, your medical aid, or even in your community. And if you're not sure what resources are available wherever you are, you can also reach out to SADAG or visit our website and we can help you. So some simple words that I'm hoping to also share with you today, um, and we'll make sure that this, you have this. Um, available, and this is already available online through SADAG's website, so you can find it, is we have an online toolkit on the SADAG website, the special button that has podcasts, videos, webinars, articles, talk about bombarding you with information, but a toolkit of information already around mental health in the workplace during COVID. Things you can go easy, user-friendly, and that you can easily share and distribute. There's also special guidelines on mental health in the workplace during COVID, how to have a conversation, what to be aware of, um, how to help managers. All of that information is there is again available on SADAG's website or Business for South Africa. You can also follow SADAG on Facebook and Twitter for daily articles. It's not all doom and gloom around mental health, but it's actually coping skills, articles to read more about. And then you could share that with your team. It's easy, you don't have to create content. There's already content out there. It's just using the right kind of content. We also at SADAG, we run every Friday, we have an online expert Q&A through our Facebook Friday. Last week, we tackled dealing with anxiety and stress around COVID-19 during the second wave. And we had over 14,000 people connected at any one given time to see and ask questions for free to the experts um, and to get free advice and help and tips. This happens every Friday. Again, go follow us on Facebook and have a look at what the week's topic is and who the experts are and share that resource with your team, your family, your friends, even on social media. So how do we promote mental awareness in the workplace? And I bet you if you Google this, you'd probably get much better pictures and posters than what I've posted here. Is train managers and team leaders on mental health. And I cannot express this more. You don't have to be a psychologist or a mental health professional. You just have to know what are the signs and symptoms and how to contain that person to get them help. You don't have to provide therapy. You don't have to provide treatment. You just have to say, hey, I'm really worried about you. I've noticed this and I've noticed that. And I'm really concerned. Let's get help. You can promote resources, encourage early intervention, encourage people to use those EAP benefits that look at all aspects of the holistic life, from financial to legal, all of that. Start by supporting those who have a mental health disorder within your teams, checking in with them more regularly. How are they doing? How are they coping? Being flexible. And there's a lot that's been happening over the last couple of years about a mental health day. Um, you know, our proverbial mental or our duvet day is a lot of benefits by gifting your team members with a mental health day. It increases productivity, it increases loyalty, and so forth, and so forth. Increase awareness. 
follow the mental health calendar, which is on SADAG's website, and pick the themes that you're focusing on within your team. Share coping tools. Again, Google is great. Go and find a poster on Pinterest um, that you can just share every Monday. Let it be your mental health Monday where you share a tip and a tool. You never know if someone needs that help. Create safe spaces. Adjust our new online meetings where we're actually asking, how are you doing? Or what have you struggled with in the last 24 hours? I think it's those kinds of things that can make a really huge difference to your team. Develop a mental health policy. And whenever we hear this, we always get so worried in the sense that, oh, but, uh, you know, this sounds so much harder. Um, I don't have time to put a guideline in. We're already so busy. There's so many things you can do, cut and paste. Um, generic ones that you can adopt, but if you start sharing it, everyone has information. And then promote mental health online assessments, apps. It's doing a questionnaire like, how stressed are you feeling today? Do you have compassion fatigue? Do you have any symptoms of burnout or depression? All of these tools are available. If you're on a medical aid, a lot of them would have these tools that you can actually go and test and do and score. That eggs website, but they're all available online for free and you're able to fill them in, self-rate them and actually figure out, should you be more worried? What can you do to adjust those levels? I wanna leave some simple key messages that I'm hoping out of all the information you've heard this morning that you can remember these really simple words, connect. Connect, connect, connect. Connect to yourself, connect to your team, connect to information, connect to webinars just like this. Connect to just finding out more, but also allowing yourself and your team, giving yourself permission for a digital disconnect. As mentioned, we're on computers and phones, always on, on, on. Scheduling time in the evening or on the weekends where you have a digital detox, it sounds really hard, but if you do it in small increments, it's really good. And it's good for your mental health to be able to switch off and try new and different things. Control. In a world that we cannot control and COVID has totally turned that on the head, it's finding out what can we control. We can control our behavior, how we manage, our response, our reaction to things, and we can control our environment all right now. So figuring out what can we control, building resilience, working on self-care, sharing coping skills, those are the things that we can do and making intentional uh, behaviors or activities to do that. Change. What can you change today after this webinar? What have you written down as your notes? Um, what reminders or apps are you going to download? But really using that is what can you change today? What can you change in how you interact with your team? What can you change within your department? What do you adopt? And I know we've given you lots and lots of tools and tips and what have you. What can you take one thing we're going to be sharing this presentation. I'm sure that there is a recording. And it's to actively watch that in the next coming weeks whenever you need a reminder. There are some helpful apps and websites. We've already streamlined. You don't have to get lost in the digital uh, black hole of, of Googling most helpful mental health resources. We already have them here. There are some really great websites that you can start. Sadag. ThoughtsFirst.com is a South African website with lots of practical tools. You've also got NAMI, sorry, I spelled that wrong. It's N-A-M-I.org, Beyond Blue and Mind in the UK. Very helpful resources, easy for you, can, yet you can also share amongst your teams via WhatsApp, email, or whichever Zoom Teams meetings you do. There's also some really great apps that you can do. Calm is really great for anxiety, mood fit, Headspace is great for meditation and mindfulness, which we can all benefit from. If you could commit to doing one minute towards your mental health every day, there's lots of research to show that it actually improves your mental well-being. These are just some of the things that as you can go through the deep hole of Pinterest and Google, these are simple posters that you can then share. You don't have to create content. You don't have to get a degree. These are simple things that could make a huge difference amongst your team. Just to end off, um, I know it's a lot of information, but here are SADAX contact details that you can also share with your team. It's great, you're welcome to screenshot this, save it on your phone, share it with your team and family and friends. 
let them know that however they're feeling, however, if they're feeling overwhelmed or not coping, that there is help. Whether they speak to the EAP, their manager, a colleague, a friend, the most important thing is that they speak to someone and that it's okay not to be okay. I encourage each and every one of you to be a champion for mental health wellness wherever you are, whichever circle you're in, whether it be for your team, your family, your home, or even just for yourself. Thank you so much for the time this morning and for allowing us to talk about mental health. I hope something you can take away and use today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Casey. Thank you, thank you. Don't switch off your camera just yet. Uh, just to be a little, because we, we, we all need to laugh, right? Laughter is going to take us through. Laughter will take us to the promised land. So you said that screen that shows 10 of the things you can do to stimulate your, 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 your mental health. I just saw one thing, and I'm sure there's many of us that did a glass of wine. That's, that's all I saw. <laughs> That is all I saw. I'm gonna to have to go back to the recording and look at everything else. But the one thing that caught my attention was a glass of wine. <laughs> the Lord knows we need that. But, but, but Casey, it is okay not to be okay. I think if we can just let that sink in. It is okay not to be okay. And this is why at times I dislike it when somebody says, be strong. Don't cry. Do, I want people to cry and deal with their emotions. I don't. I don't want. People, I want people not to be strong. You, you know, uh, it, because it's okay not to be okay. I really think that you know my my take out from many 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 things that I'm taking out of what you shared with us is that it's okay to not to be okay. It doesn't make you any less human. Um, you know, and, 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 and also, so mental illness is, is, a, is a topic that is very close to my heart. Um, uh, you know, and, 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 and I couldn't agree with you more when you say, we, when you first opened, you said that you feel like we need a four hour session just to talk about mental um, health. I agree. I mean, man, mental illness outside of the pandemic, which is just another spanner in the works, is, is a reality that we live with every day of our lives. And uh, so with that said, I think I think I think I will propose it proudly in South African that at least every quarter we have this discussion because because it is it, it'll take us a long time. It'll really take us a long time as a people to be okay again. Uh, uh, the, the pandemic has 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 cost you know immeasurable damage. You agree? It really has caused immeasurable damage. So, and also, you know, mental, um, uh, 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 my take from what you said, and which is something I've always believed in because, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time researching uh, mental illness, particularly Alzheimer's and dementia because a family member succumbed to it. And what I do know for sure is that mental um, sickness is, is just like any other sickness. And any other disease, it doesn't, uh, you know, we, we can't, we shouldn't be boxing it and it shouldn't be taboo. It is just like a headache or, uh, you know, a bug, a tummy ache, it's, it, or any, any other illness. It is a sickness just like any other illness that we should be able to embrace and appreciate and understand that 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 you know it happens it happens to all of us. In fact, in fact I've got bad news for us in a way, is that uh, you know having having researched mental illness for the longest time that we all have stage one of dementia. All of us, we all forget where we've put our car keys every day. We all forget where you've put your pen the last time you used it. It's little things like that. We all forget where you've put your notepad. Uh, we've all, some of us as parents, we, you even confuse the names of your two children. You call this one by that one's name. And when that one says, it's not me that it's in trouble. And you say, but you all know who I'm talking to. You, you know, we all do it. We've all got stage one of it. And, and that, it is what it is. We've all, we've also, so mental illness is really 
uh, a, a, a disease like any other disease. But my, my, my biggest highlight uh, of what you said today is that take care of yourself. How are you today? How are you today? It reminds me of a, post, a Facebook post that I posted two, three days ago when I was having a moment. So I have conversations with myself. You walk into a room and you'll think, where's the person you're talking to? Uh, they don't have to be visible, but it's you know, for me, it is therapy to be able to talk to myself if and when the needs arise. But and it doesn't make me any different uh, to, a, to a normal human being. It says that the universe never taught us how to guard and prepare our hearts when dealing with the pandemic of this magnitude. We are a mess, let's admit, individually and collectively. Be kind to your own heart first. You cannot give from an empty cup. What is inside the cup is yours. And what overflows from the cup, you can then give to the rest of the people around you. Some of us are infected. Uh, but we are all affected. We shall over, overcome this horrific pain that has paralyzed our souls one day. So, so thank you so, so much, uh, 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 Casey, for, for, for sharing. I, I mean, this is invaluable information and I'm glad that we're recording this, but, but while I have you on screen, I would like to find out from the audience and I'd like to find out from the technical team behind uh, the scenes. Do we? Does anybody have a comment for Stace, for Casey? Uh, a comment, a question. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. It really doesn't. It might sound weird. It's okay to be weird. <laughs> please, switch, please go ahead, Casey. What do you think of what I've just said? Is it? <laughs> No, and, and happy. I mean, it just, it's your, your sentiments and your message is so real, right? Is that we're humans, we're experiencing, we're navigating, we're readjusting. It's just to make sure we also look after ourselves. Um, and I think that's the biggest message is that we often, and especially with regards to HR and wellness and EAP programs is they come up with all these plans to, to put in place and to companies and within departments but yet we forgot to, you know, forget to look after them too. And I think it's to give ourselves permission to look after ourselves and also say that self-care is important. Mental health is important. And if we don't start practicing that, how are we going to expect anyone, whether it be your staff, your team, even your children, to follow suit with that? Um, so I just, it, it's so great to have people who also support mental health and mental wellness. Um, and that's why we really, yeah, I think it's amazing that over 40 people came and we're already starting to break that stigma one brick at a time. So right. thank you. Absolutely. May I please ask all the other speakers to switch on their cameras as well, uh, while we're still trying to figure out whether anybody in the audience uh, wants to say anything. And any of you, uh, 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 before we close the, 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 the session officially, is welcome to say anything or add on to what we said. Masha, Nevania, uh, you know, if, you, if you'd like to say anything, you're more than welcome to grab the mic, so to speak, uh, and say something. Masha, would you like to comment? Now I'm good at this stage, but I've just, um, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. And of course, this is the reality when I hear the different speakers' um, presentations and uh, it is a reality. And as the group business development officer, uh, I, I, I gleaned a bit from, um, um, this, from Nirvana and from uh, Cassie's. And uh, as, a, uh, uh, you know, as one that has not had any um, infections at work, yet in my family, uh, you know, um, a closest family member has passed on in my home. So yes, the stress, the, the, the massive level of stress to still be a mom, uh, um, you know, um, at home, to still be a mother, to still be a daughter, a, a, a wife, a friend, and then still to be an employee is massive. So of course, um, you know, we, when you hear, take care of yourself, you then realize and say, yeah, it's, it's not wrong to do that. So thank you so much, Cassie, as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Masha. Before I, I, uh, I give anybody else an opportunity, I just want to say that uh, 
I see, I mean, we have a lot of people who are still online, attendees who are not saying anything. So I'm going to pick on people to say something from the audience. Uh, you know, I'm going to pick on you, Johanna Maingard. There's Johanna Mzuli that I'm going to pick on. Lara Haskins, you're not saying anything. Surely someone can say something. Uh, you know, you see now you're making me pick on you so moodily. Where are you? Uh, Tatum Evans. Uh, Stephen Forbes, no one's saying anything. I'm going to pick on you. But with that said, there is one question for you, Cass, Cassie, I think uh, is, is directed at you. It says, uh, or anybody actually, I think any of the, of the, of the panelists can take it. Uh, how does it help the company to have a policy on mental health? Thank you. That's Vanya? Oh, Cassie, you go ahead. Yes, and I'd love to also uh, bring Navanya in as well, um, you know, especially from an employee assistance program. And, and I think, you know, from, from our perspective as SADAG, it's really important to have a policy. A, we know that policies are adopted by companies. So for a company to say mental health is important and we even have a policy, it sounds really important. There's a fancy document with the logo on and everyone has the information from someone who's lower, lower levels to top management to finance, everyone understands how that company see, sees and perceives mental health issues and how they help employees. And I think having it all on the same page, having all the information out there can really make a huge difference to those questions that employees often have. Well, what happens if I need to take time off? Or what happens if I'm not coping? Or what happens if having a policy can be really helpful in just making sure that your company has said mental health is important. This is the information that is out there and it starts the conversation that people know who to engage with and how to engage. Navani, I'm sure you could add to that too. Yes, I think Cassie, you spot on there. Um, I think the first thing is it obviously it gives structure. So it tells employees that we value you and we and we recognize that this is something that everybody is going through. So you're also in a sense normalizing it. So you're saying that it's okay to be going through this. And from the CEO to the tea lady, we all experience the same things and we all deal with it in the same way. So you're also showing employees that you know uh, there is a, there is a service and it's the same across the board. So when we do experience this, we all experience it in the same way, and we all have access to the same support. And like you say, you know it's it's important for people to know and understand what is available to them. Um, you know, as an EAP provider, we often say that a wellness service or a wellness program is absolutely useless if there isn't awareness um, about the services. So like Cassie said in her presentation as well, it's important to remind people about the service. Um, you know, my team often laugh at me, but I say that it's good to put it behind the bathroom doors, um, you know, information, because that's when people look at it and they remind themselves, oh, yes, actually, I do need to speak to somebody about my will, um, or I haven't been feeling well, let me give them a call as well. So, yes, definitely to assist to give structure and uh, support. Uh, thank you so, so much, um, Devanya and Casey, thank you. Um, I, I see, I see I was on the right track when I started uh, picking on, on, on our attendees. Uh, suddenly there's a whole lot of comments, which is fantastic because this is the whole idea. It's not about us as panelists having a chat with, uh, between ourselves. We can give each other a call. Uh, you know, outside of the session, uh, but it's really about the people that have logged on to, to you know, to, to, to come and listen to this. Uh, uh, Johanna says, as an SME, as, a, as an SME, how does it, how much does it cost to have workshops on a monthly basis regarding mental health? Amongst you ladies who does workshops, and how much does it cost? I can probably chime in from SADAG being an NGO um, is that we have free workshops, webinars, talks, articles all the time. Um, and there's a lot of actually webinars that are that are out there in the public that are for free that you can easily plug into. So again, it doesn't have to cost you um, to, to access these resources. Go and have a look at what's happening with upcoming webinars or talks or what has already happened. We have a whole list of webinar recordings that you can access. Um, and we often share on our Facebook and Twitter 
other new webinars that are happening, workshops, talks, all kinds of things that you can, again, plug in and share. So follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, subscribe to our newsletter and we can let you know. Um, it's so important that people know that there is information available and it doesn't have to cost you. If you are looking to have a specific workshop for your team or a department, for example, maybe within your division, there's been a recent loss or grieving and you'd like to have a debriefing or a bit of a workshop just to discuss it, then we can bring in experts and sometimes there, there are small fees. Um, but again, you can even speak to your EAP, you can speak to your medical aid and tap into those resources that are available to make sure that you can get those workshops in place. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much, uh, Casey. Um, uh, you know, I'm so glad that uh, that there's there's now so many comments. It's, it's amazing, it's lovely to see. Joanna says, um, uh, you know, uh, somebody says, fantastic presentation. Thank you all. Uh, that's Tracy Fainston saying that uh, an all female panel of great presentations and passionate speakers. Well done. I think we uh, we deserve to clap for ourselves. It's an all female um, uh, 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 panelist which is great. Uh, and there's somebody, remember that at Proudly South Africa, we organize these uh, forums uh, for the benefit of our member companies who log on most of the time and other people who may want to join the movement. There is a comment from Mr. Price Group. Uh, Mr. Price Group says, uh, Casey, I would love to know how to create a mental health policy uh, I wouldn't know where to start at that. I head up wellness for the Mr. Price group. Uh, and I thought your presentation was incredible. Uh, and I will definitely be using, uh, and I will definitely be using, uh, sorry guys, uh, technology. Yeah, And I will definitely uh, be, be using a lot of what you said in my organization. And I'd like to respond to that. What I will do is that we, will we are committing as Proudly South African to link you up with whoever it is that you would like to engage outside of this. So, so Johanna, we're very happy to link you up with Casey. Uh, please email us a reminder on, oh, no, no, yeah, you know, on, on, on this email address, events at Proudly South Africa, and say, you know, I'm the lady who wants to be hooked up with Casey, and we're very happy to do that. But I'll also ask our technical uh, team behind the scenes to look out for these messages and make sure that we, we act on them. Um, and I, I'd like to take the very last one. I mean, the, now there's many. At some point, we had nothing. But we have to close the session, and 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 I and I behave like a like the first lady. Remember, my middle name is Makumalo, the, the 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 first lady, and I said you will ask questions, you will make comments, you can't keep quiet, and then all of a sudden everybody listened to what I said, <laughs> which is a great thing to see. But my biggest struggle when talking about mental health, this is a comment by the way, or wellness in general, is that I find that employees will only engage in content when they need it. Often then it is too late. I want them to engage in the material before they, for example, experience grief. So if you have any suggestions on how to get employees to own their health, I would love to know. This is Johanna. Uh, Johanna, we'll, 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 um, I don't know if any of our panelists would like to quickly say something as we close to that in particular, just a suggestion on how to handle that. Casey, Navanya, Masha. Now I'm good at this stage. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think just from my side, um, uh, it's important to create awareness around the program that you have um, and also to create proactive and to, to change the, um, the conversation or the narrative from always being, you know, contacting um, your wellness provider, for example, or getting support only when uh, something negative happens. So often I say to people, you know, contact wellness when you find out you're pregnant, for example, so that you can see um, how they can assist you. Perhaps they can give you advice on what um, nutrition to follow, um, you know, how to prepare for the baby. So it's important about changing the narrative around your wellness events or around your wellness program to make sure that it is more proactive and positive um, as well, and also to create more behavior change programs. So unfortunately, you have to have behavior change in order to get people to see things differently. Um, so there are various different programs that can be put in place to actually assist with things like this. 
And I, I'd like to add for two seconds, sorry, Happy, and no you know, problem. we often find having talks on depression or grief are often very heavy in the workplace, and people are, are quite nervous to attend thinking, well, if someone sees me at the workshop on depression, they're going to think I have depression, and then my boss is going to think I can't do my job. So often, maybe just making it more uh, appealing and more positive, like Navani is saying, having connect sessions, having a coffee catch-up where you just have a, a discussion and you come together and you share with everyone. Having guest speakers, um, I see companies often have town halls and every time they have various different speakers and it could be from healthy eating or managing stress or we do find that the talks on stress are a lot more popular than talks on depression. So I think it's finding those, those kinds of topics, those really sexy headings that people can attend. And you'll be surprised if you're doing a talk on grief or a debriefing on grief, share information with everyone in, in your company because you never know who needs to attend or see that information. Um, so sometimes it is hard to find those small groups or those small moments to cover those topics. But sometimes just having a connect session and talking about and starting the conversation can be really surprising. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Casey. Thank you. Thank you for the informative session. It's been helpful to sit on the other side and receive support, says Lerato Ndlov. That's important, Lerato. As much as you're a health practitioner or in HR or whatever, you are also human who also needs help and who also needs to hear other people talk, speak to you. Uh, that's what Lerato says on the platform. Thank you so much, ladies. I mean, we can talk forever. Yeah. This is it, it goes without uh, saying that this is a, a critical discussion, an important discussion. And before I hand over to my colleague, Darren Graham, who will do the vote of thanks, I just want to thank you, ladies. But also just to say, all of us who are watching, remember one thing, in the midst of the madness, most of us sitting in this forum today, we still have a job. Yeah. We still have a job. There's millions of people who are not only battling the pandemic, the worries about, around it, the concerns around it, the trauma around it, but they're worried about the fact that they have lost their job. We still have a job. And, and, and if it's the only thing that I want you to take away from me today is just that. Have an appreciation. Be thankful. Be grateful. You still have a job. Uh, Darren, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Mine is just a very short job um, just to deliver the thanks. And I don't think just in summary, I don't think there's any doubt about the importance of our having these conversations. And at the same time as COVID has brought about more mental health issues and made people more vulnerable, it's also been a time um, which has enabled us to be perhaps more frank and more open about, um, about our problems, about our challenges and issues. So um, double-edged sword. I think COVID would recognise it's brought lots of lots of things with it, lots of positives and lots of negatives. But thank you all for your contributions. Um, I, if your takeaway happy from Cassie's presentation was the wine, mine was the duvet day. And I think in, in this weather, the thought of climbing under the duvet, uh, nothing more appealing in this horrid weather. Um, so Cassie, thank you so much. Your organisation does such amazing work. Um, and I think your statistics about not taking care of mental health issues and dealing with mental health, health issues, the costs um, were, were more shocking than, um, than, than any of the other stats. So I think it's important to recognize the, the immense cost um, to economies, to people, um, to companies of not dealing with mental health issues. So I think that was very important. Um, Navanya, your comments on complicated grief um, I think everything is complicated, but that was that really struck me. That complicated grief um, comment and uh, was very was very moving, um, and just highlights that everything has become very complicated for us and uh, and needs addressing. Marsha, your your energy and passion for working with communities and and keeping people motivated and moving was was um, amazing. So you could hear that energy and passion really came through um, in your presentation. So thank you all. Thank you, Happy, um, as always, for being a, a, an animated MC. Um, just to say that everybody that's logged in, you will get the recording with the presentations 
um, you will get that automatically, the recording of the session and the three presentations will be coming through to you. And also we have a competition today. We're running a competition. We'll be sending a question along with that follow-up email, a question relating to the content of today's webinar. Um, it will be open for you, uh, open for a week. So insofar as you're getting the recording, there should be no wrong answers because you can replay the, the session and, and get the answers. And there is a 500 Rand shopping voucher for our proudly South African online shopping store, rsamade.co.za. So look out for that question. And I just want to say thank you to the rest of the team, the backroom um, people, our technical people and events people at Proudly South African for putting this together. I think it was a really valuable um, topic and perhaps one we should repeat in a few months time. So thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our staff members and thank you to everybody who attended and watched today. Thank you so much. Session closed. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.